Greetings, all. Um, I'm going to show you some things that I've been learning in Dorico and some of the interesting um, uh, ways it functions. And uh, I don't know that they've documented some of these things, so it's kind of um, just kind of a exploration and a uh, little bit of a walk through some of the uh, different features. Uh, so to me, this is the real reason to switch to Dorico um, for me. And I would think some other composers who are more uh, in the quote-unquote academic realm, which means that you're composing for or uh, for concert settings. You're not doing film scoring. Because if you're doing film scoring, most likely you're working within your DAW. You're not writing the notation out for the instruments to play. You're actually just playing it into your DAW and creating the sound. And um, you, know, you may go back and do the notation later, pulling out the MIDI and putting it into a DAW and so forth. But um, the, for me, I work primarily in, um, as a composer, I'm working in the score. And then trying to get the output so that it goes to a good demo uh, mix in a DAW later. But with Dorico, um, we can really eliminate some of the long procedures that it takes f exporting MIDI and then going into your DAW and doing the uh, expression controls and whatnot. Um, so that's one of the things I wanted to show in, or demonstrate in this video. Um, so this is just my score for Mars. Okay, and so here is the, the to me this is the the fantastic part of Dorco is controlling your dynamic uh, expression here. You can't do this in Finale, and I and I've used Sibelius a little bit, but and I've never gotten this far into Sibelius, but I don't know that you can do this in Sibelius at all. Uh, but you can definitely do this in Dorico, and it's so much easier. You, yeah, you can get some of these things to sort of kind of happen in Finale, but uh, you're you're using a, a line tool and it's just very awkward and you really have to understand exactly what the ratios are and, and there's a lot of math involved it's just so difficult and here you just draw in what you want and you test it and you make sure it sounds the, the way you want it to sound and you're you're done um and this will export with the midi once once i'm ready to export the uh score into the midi so that i can actually do the recording in my daw this will all go with it so i can tweak the score here in Dorico, and then basically, then I can just focus on the mixing portion uh, in the DAW. Um, and of course, uh, Dorico is pretty sophisticated um, mixer as well. Let me pull that up for you here. Um, so there are effects, and uh, you can all you know you can do inserts and EQs. I mean, there it's possible you could actually do a full out demo right out of Dorico, uh, but again, it's not. It's, it's not programmed to specifically do that, so I would imagine that there are some limitations. I don't think I'm going to try that, uh, not, not in the near future anyways. I'm going to continue to work on making different versions of Mars uh, with different uh, synthesizers and VSTs and uh, note performance, th things like that, just to kind of have a comparison between the different uh, samples and whatnot. But uh, yeah, the, uh, the, but this is really the, the main thing for Dorico. Uh, I think that is just fantastic and light years ahead of Sibelius and... Uh, finale and probably the other ones too. I'm no, Note Flight or whatever the other Muse Muse score is the other one. Um, yeah, just being able to draw in your velocity curves um, is just so fantastic. It's just it makes life so much easier. So let me just demonstrate a couple of things. Um, I'm using VE Pro, so I have all of my uh, instruments set up in VE Pro, which is again another great. A tool because you can load up a full orchestra here it sits in memory uh, you can switch between different orchestral projects and not wait 10 minutes in between uh, loading of all your samples into memory uh, they can stay there all day long and you can switch between projects and it's wonderful for that uh, also um, I've done some demonstrations where uh, Dorico you can put BBC Orchestra directly into Dorico, and it works, but the uh, playback becomes very precarious with such a large piece like this. Um, with you know, I've got 45 different instruments going on here, um, and Dorico can do it, but it's it becomes uh, cumbersome because it's just so much information for Dorico to be controlling. When Dorico can just send out the MIDI information and send it to VE Pro, it just it makes Dorico much more functional. Um, so I uh, definitely recommend the ePro for playback. And of course, uh, if I switch from Dorico, I output the MIDI file in, and I can uh, bring it into my DAW, which for me is Cakewalk. Um, I can leave the ePro up and go directly from 
working with the score here in Dorco and in a couple of minutes be up and running in Cakewalk and uh, I'm ready to, to, to record that way. So that it is fantastic for um, making the procedures a lot quicker and um, a lot less loading time and so forth between projects and, so, and, and such. So uh, I highly recommend uh, VE Pro as well uh, for a setup. So uh, getting back to the demonstration at hand, let me pull up the gong part. Um, I've been I've been experimenting with uh, drawing in these curves uh, using uh, again the BBC Orchestra. Now I have in my playback uh, settings here. Um, I'm using uh, the um, expression maps and the percussion maps that were programmed by John Barron from uh, Dorco. He did a great job, and uh, so it's one of the things I've discovered. I'm going to demonstrate that, that for you. Uh, is you do, if you want your uh, dynamic control to actually control the um, the CC controllers in Doric, uh, from Dorico into uh, the BBC Orchestra, you actually have to put the expression maps, you have to load, you have to select this, the unpitched percussion, as well as uh, the percussion maps for these unpitched percussions. Because, and I'll demonstrate this, the the percussion map will only work the key switching and so forth for the different articulations or the different samples uh, in BBC Symphony Orchestra. But uh, this has to be enabled to uh, control the actual uh, dynamics. So I've got the Tam Tam part here s selected, and right now it's set to default. So this is not going to have any control over the CC uh, because of the settings right now. So let me demonstrate that for you from the beginning of Mars. And I'll also solo the gong part. I, we won't listen to too much of it, but just so you can get the idea. Where am I? Uh, pull my mixer back up. Oh, sorry, cancel that. Okay, so you can see that that... So right now, the uh, setting is for the Tam Tam to not have CC moving. And I'll bring back the uh, Tam Tam plugin, okay? And let me hit play. And I'm for now just gonna I'm gonna turn down the input into the uh, uh, the recording video software just a little bit so you can see you can hear me better. Um, you can see this. I mean, it's full out on out outputting, and these controllers are not moving even though this information is saying, you know, move the volume controller here. Okay? All right, enough of that. So let me go back here and change this now. I will put this back to unpitched percussion. Okay, so now I've selected the expression map. And I did, the, uh, all I did was I was experimenting earlier, so I've, I had done a few changes to the uh, unpitched percussion earlier um, because I was having issues with um, the wrong MIDI key switching happening. And um, so that's the only reason I have something slightly different here. But um, the, un the regular unpitched percussion map would work as well in this situation. So now I've changed that. Let me just double check that I changed that successfully. Yes, okay. Let me send this back to the beginning and then I will bring up the uh, let me start the playback and I'll bring up the patch okay and let me bring up the volume now that I, I can so now we can see that I've enabled the expression maps to work as well as the percussion map that now the these uh, controllers are actually going uh, together uh, I don't know if these have separate effects in the percussion patches. Obviously, one controlled vibrato in the string patches and the and the other uh, woodwind patches and the brass patches. But uh, I don't know if it has any effect in the percussion or if they just work together. But anyways, it's doing what I want it to do, which is controlling the volume of this tam tam. Now you might be able to hear, even with the uh, compression from YouTube, you might be able to hear we're getting that machine gun effect. Um, Sorry about that. When we stop the playback, the volume goes all the way to full. Um, because I think Dorico is, is automatically doing, uh, because in the score, it's, of course, it's, um, in the score, it's a roll or tremolo. Um, Dorico is automatically just uh, applying 30-second uh, notes here to all that.
or maybe 16th notes in this case. Uh, but it's automatically doing – so that's why I think we're getting that machine gun effect. And I'm not sure how to disable that. There's probably a way, but I uh, – because obviously um, – and we have the same problem when we get to the violin tremolos a little later on here. Uh, it uh, Dorico is re-triggering all this stuff. So you're getting the – even though we have on BBC Symphony Orchestra, we have a uh, tremolo patch, a tremolo sample, and it, it could just use that. For some reason, Dorico is – is always pinging down that, uh, re-triggering it on the 16th notes again. Um, what do they call those in England? Hemi, semi-quavers or something? Semi-demi, hemi-quavers? I don't know. <laughs> Quavers are eighth notes, so whatever the hem, semi, hemi, semi-quavers, I guess would be, yeah, semi-quavers. Okay, sorry. Uh, let's see here. So that's uh, just a couple of things on on the functionality of the percussion maps and uh, how to use the expression controls with uh, from Dorico and working with the BBC Symphony Orchestra um, and John Barron's uh, uh, expression maps and percussion maps. Um, so let me just demonstrate. Uh, I'm going to go to a different section here. And demonstrate the um, copying and pasting function in inside of those issues. So let's see here. Uh, there we go. All right, I'm going to unsolo that, and then let's see. Yeah, I'll do a different. I haven't done this section. Yet. Let me find something that's interesting to work on. Okay. Um, so now you can see, uh, again, this is, let me, if you want to, uh, increase the views so that you can see or w work with the, um, dynamics and controls a little bit more, you can in increase the, um, you know, the, the, uh, size of that window. So you can do more fine controls if you want like that, but you have to, you have to get that little arrow right here on the, on that line. So you have to be right over to the left hand side to get that area to enlarge or whatnot um okay so let's see uh let's take a look at the french horn one and two so we can uh, enable the different dynamics velocity and controller layers so the dynamics is where you actually do the drawing you can't draw dynamics into the cc here uh, because the dynamics is controlling cc1 in this case um, but uh, when we make a change here in this window we should see it affect here so let me do something extreme so you can see the difference. Um, and the velocity, of course, is that's the velocity that the trigger starts the the MIDI pitch. So I notice, like with French horns, if you have the if you have the velocity high, you can still you can still get a, a soft dynamic on a high velocity. Uh, it just gets that really super brassy sound that uh, you get from a French horn when you're playing it for TCC Mo. Um, okay, so. Um, there is some control that uh, Dorico is adding to add some uh, additional CC control here uh, for the dynamics. But if I draw in a new curve here, let me just make it extreme right now. Yeah, you see how that duplicated what I just did here. You can't draw it. No, well, I guess you can draw in this section. But this won't reflect up here. This is strictly here. So uh, I suppose if you really want to override something, you can do it down here in the CC window or the CC track. But uh, if this is really where you can do the dynamic controls and it will affect, it'll reflect down here into this area. So I think that's probably a better way to, um, to do it in my perspective. So of course I'm using the pencil tool to draw. We can do a line. Use the line tool. Okay, and of course it didn't do that. It didn't change here because I had drawn that in manually. So I'm going to go in and use the select tool, and I'm going to select this and delete. And so now it's going to it's going to default back to whatever was drawn in this area. So if I do that line again here this way, now you'll see that the uh, the, the that it reflects the drawing I had up here. So um, I'm not sure. I haven't figured out if this is – let me pull up the window there. Um, if this is related to this volume or this controller here and this one is related to this one directly, I'm not sure. Um, 
well, let's let's do, let's do an experiment right now. We can see. I'll hit play a couple measures beforehand. Sorry about that. So we could see that um, the, both of both those controllers were working simultaneously, uh, following these two curves. So let's let's go ahead and do an experiment where we draw in. I'll do opposite curves to see if that's going to affect one controller and then the other one differently. So we'll do an extreme thing here, okay? And I'll play that back. In fact, let me uh, solo that so we don't have to. Uh, we can hear the actual effect on the playback as well, uh, independently. Playback and then pull up that window. Yeah, so we can see we can see the uh, the effects of this where uh, the dynamics was affecting the um, uh, that controller, and then the CC one is affecting this controller, which is the expression, I believe. All right, so that was a good little experiment to figure out how that is working together. Now, uh, going back to your window here, um, obviously in the score, it has dynamics marked, okay? Mezzo forte, for, double forte. Um, we have um, the Dorico automatically applies certain uh, effects or certain curves and velocity changes and whatnot. So it is smart and it does it pretty well. So if we decide we want to go back to the default, I can just go ahead and highlight all this and hit delete and it goes immediately back to the default settings. I do that here as well. So I delete and it goes back to the default settings. So, uh, <coughs> excuse me, these are the fine controls for the um, expression that Dorico adds in. And of course you can, you can supersede that with your own, uh, but it looks like it wants to mirror what you have written up here. So if we have, as I did earlier, if we write the, um, if we do a curve specifically up here, it's going to reflect that there. So that's interesting. And of course we can change that independently. Let me show you this little aspect here. All right, I'm gonna, I'll start with the length of those notes. I'll solo those two French horns just so we can hear the difference. Um, yeah. All right, we're gonna solo one and two, French horn one and French horn two. Okay, so uh, let's just do a little demonstration. I'll draw in a curve here, and I'll draw in a curve here on the second French horn, okay? So we'll hear that. <laughs> okay, so again, that's immediate uh, change on the feedback and the playback, um, but let's say that we want we want to do this type of a thing, you know, like a sforzando kind of effect. Again, there are patches that can do that, but uh, or or triggers. Uh... Okay, and you want the entire horn section to do the exact same expression. You want them all to do that all simultaneously together. Okay, so we can, uh, and I have not figured out exactly the exact correct procedure to do this, but I'm going to show you kind of what works, okay? So we can select that curve. I'm gonna hit Control C, but I'm going to make sure I'm selecting the track of the dynamics here. So again, I'm selecting not the French horn track, but this specific dynamic track here. I'm gonna hit Control C, uh, or you can do it this way from the menu, okay? But I'm doing Control C. I'm going to, right where I want that to start, right there, I selected that node, 
on that particular dynamics curve, I'm going to go and select that dynamics lane or track, and I'm going to hit control V. Ah, so you see what happened was, and I forgot to do this one piece, it put this here because that's where the playhead was. So I'm gonna control Z that. And now do it that way. Okay, and so there we go. I've copied that curve to this the other French horn part. And if I hit play now. Yeah, so obviously it's not really a great particular use in this case because it's a long tone. And if we really wanted that effect, um, we would actually use the key switch in the patch for, I think there's one for that Sforzando type of effect. Let's see. Uh, I'm, I am getting, this is all new information for me as I'm learning how to use all of these tools together at the same time. The BBC Symphony Orchestra, the VE Pro, and Dorico. I'm, Dorico is taking a lot longer to learn just because it's more dense, but... Um, yeah, the, the, the BBC I've only had for about a month, so I'm still working with that and learning how to use all this stuff. So, yeah, we have the different articulations here. And uh, let's see. Yeah, Sforzano there right there. So that would be where you'd want to actually use the key switch for the Sforzano. And, of course, um, with the expression map that John Barron created, if that were actually marked in the score as a Sforzano, it would just switch to that... Um, that key switch and you wouldn't really need to do this type of a curve you would absolutely have uh it would the dorico would switch to that key switch and then if you wanted to just tweak it a little bit you could use that curve to tweak the sound coming out of it so um let me uh, go ahead and delete all that that i just did because i don't want to leave that there okay so again i can control z to undo or we can just delete what we drew in and it will default back to the Dorico. So those are really, really interesting tools that we have in Dorico to uh, control the playback and to get the sound that we really are looking for out of our um, VST instruments in um, in our playback and in you know hopefully the final product. Uh, and, and like I said, in my opinion, this this is what makes Dorico invaluable as a tool for modern composition because you can actually control all those different parameters and you can add, I believe, or at least change this to different controller uh, settings here. So you can change which one you're working. I don't know that you can add additional um, uh, additional tracks as far as that goes. I don't I don't think so, but. Um, you can certainly uh, change if you need to control a specific one for different instruments, then you can change that in here and be able to control and draw in your own setting. So again, that, that makes this very invaluable. Uh, obviously, that would be really effective for uh, a solo. If you, had, if you had a solo passage with uh, an instrument, you can really, really uh, work your expression in that way. And again, the note lengths as well. You can, you can stretch or shorten note lengths a little bit here. Um, in the piano roll view, let me... Let me bring that make that a little larger okay and of course you can zoom in and zoom out um, so here we can select the value and then we can shorten the note length now you can see that uh, the block is what the playback will do Okay, and then the bottom line is showing you what the notation says. So you can you can make that you can change that and make it a little longer, lengthen the note. Okay, and I don't know if we switch to score view. We'll look at that measure. Uh, go into the score view. Are we looking at our French horn? Yes. Okay. Oh, and we're not on the same measure. We were around 14. Okay. So, yeah, that is the note I just altered. Uh, I made it longer, but, again, it didn't change the notation in the score. So that is, an, uh, a, 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 again, another a awesome thing that we have to control our... Um, 
note lengths and releases and that kind of thing here in the uh, score view, or excuse me, not in the score view, in the uh, piano roll view uh, in the play window here. Uh, fantastic, fantastic way to, to do things. And, and uh, again, uh, it when you're composing, you know, you're you're trying to make you're trying to make the scores as easy for your musicians to read, but you may really want a specific sound. And so when you're looking at note lengths and releases and that kind of thing, you can really tweak it here so that it sounds the way you want, but it's written in a more easy to read manner here in the score. So again, fantastic uh, ability here with Dorico that we just don't have in Finale and I don't think in Sibelius or any of the other composing programs or engraving slash notation programs. So uh, uh, this is, again, uh, this is the reason to switch from uh, anything to Dorico because you can do these types of things right in your score, right immediately when you start, when you have an idea, you can, you can, you can affect the expression immediately and get it to sound exactly how you want um, and not have to fight with uh, doing it later on in your DAW. And you can, you can put those ideas immediately into your, pro your performance, your, uh, your demo, however you want to observe or call that. Uh, so you can immediately put those ideas into your composition as you're going, and, and that makes it wonderful. So thank you folks at Dorco for making this possible. This is so awesome to be able to do this while we're writing in the, in the sketching process and as well as in the orchestration process and whatnot. It's just so awesome. So thank you very much. Really, really great tools here in Dorico to really realize what you hear in your head and, uh, right when you're writing it, right when you're sketching. And so this is just fantastic, tremendous stuff. So thanks again, Dorico. And um, uh, hopefully this was uh, a, a valuable little demonstration and or tutorial for you. And uh, thank you for stopping by. Bye-bye.